Brian, welcome to the podcast. It's great to have you. Thank, thank you much for having me. I'm grateful to be here. Yeah. So, uh, you know, as mentioned just before we started here, like I was kind of reviewing your site and uh, and your podcast and what you do, and you kind of have a, you have a very wide ar- array of sort of things that you do and, and work in sort of like even like spir- spiritual entrepreneurship. Um, mm-hmm. And just for people listening, for anybody who's never heard of you, uh, could you start by just maybe just telling us a little bit about like who you are, what you do, and and how you kind of got started on your journey? Sure, absolutely. So my name is Brian Dixon, and I live in St. Louis, Missouri right now. I've been very fortunate to be able to travel all around the world with the work that I've done. And I've had a very interesting journey throughout the years in terms of how I've kind of mixed spirituality and entrepreneurship. Um, A little background on myself in terms of how I got to where I am now is I was initially in law school and I learned about cryptocurrency, specifically Bitcoin, when it first came out. And this was in like the 2011 timeframe. So it was very early for the cryptocurrency days. And I learned about it in an online article and became completely fascinated by the topic. And I was like, I somehow have to get involved with this because I think this could be a really big change for how different types of systems are built in the future. So it was at that point I decided I didn't want to go in and become an attorney, but I ended up finishing up school and I was working at a firm. And then I uh, decided, you know, if I want to get in the technology side of things, I really need to transition out of this. I don't want to you know, do this for 10 or 15 years and look back on my life and say, oh, I regret not doing this sooner. So I ended up leaving the firm I was at with no plan about how I wanted to get into technology just yet or understanding how I was going to do it, just putting faith in the universe that it was going to work out, whatever I wanted to end up doing towards my highest and best. And, you know, funny enough, I ended up watching this documentary on Netflix called Something Ventured about a week after I left the law firm I was at. And the documentary is about the godfathers that started venture capital in a sense. So basically investing in startup companies, primarily usually in the technology space, helping these companies grow, how they created venture capital investment funds initially, And the main guy in this documentary was a guy by the name of Don Valentine. And he created a company called Sequoia Capital. And Sequoia Capital is arguably one of the most successful venture capital firms in the world that's invested in Apple and Oracle and all these major technology companies that most people use on a daily basis. And I actually just messing around online, found the founder's email address and I shot him a note and I was like, hey, just finished law school, don't want to be an attorney, very fascinated by technology, saw you in this movie, do you have any advice? I would love some mentorship from you. And he ended up uh, calling me about a week and a half later, completely out of the blue. This guy's a multi-billionaire. I never expected him to ever just reach out to me and spoke with me for about an hour and a half on the phone and just gave me some tremendously valuable advice about how he thinks about the investment landscape and technology and kind of the path that I wanted to take moving forward. And so at that point, I was really fortunate to take his advice, integrate it into my path of what I wanted to do next from a personal and a career perspective. And I got in really early on with a company here in St. Louis called Capital Innovators. And what Capital Innovators does is we fund early stage technology startups through venture capital investment firms. Um, And we also run early stage companies through a 12 week program called an accelerator to scale these entrepreneurs businesses really quickly. And so that's a combination of investment, we provide them with office space throughout the course of a 12 week program, each company gets access to a little over a million dollars worth of perks and benefits through partnerships that we have. So that could be things like reduced cost legal services, accounting services, free software products, and just a variety of different product and service based perks. And then each company we invest in, we pair with what we call a lead mentor that acts as a co-CEO with that company throughout the entirety of the three-month program. And these are very experienced entrepreneurs or executives that have worked with startups throughout the years or built their own startups. And we really mentor and help guide these companies to success. And so I got in very early with this company. Um, I've been with them now for seven years as we've scaled, um, started off by just walking in their office saying, hey, I'm very fascinated by what you do. I would love to work for you for free. And that's how I initially started working for the company. And um, seven years later, we scaled the company significantly around the world. And we've been extremely blessed to raise multiple venture capital funds. We funded now 130 startups that have gone on to raise close to 400 million in investment and created about 2000 jobs um, for the different companies that we've helped fund and help grow. 
And so it's, it's been, you know, just a really remarkable ride over the last seven years. And alongside that, um, I've always been just so fascinated by human consciousness and the nature of our reality and kind of the mixture of spirituality and science. And, you know, I was raised um, in, in the Christian religion, but I always, as I was like sitting in church every Sunday, I always like think like, there's just got to be more to this, right? There's got to be way more than like this one singular concept. Um, and so throughout my whole life, I've always been super fascinated by all sorts of different religions and spiritualities and kind of understanding the dynamics between the similarities and the differences between them. But when you really extract the core themes from everything, there's, there's very similar things between all sorts of different religions that people are trying to get to. And I've really incorporated that, that sense of science and spirituality into a lot of what I do on a daily basis, how I guide entrepreneurs, how I guide my own life. And a couple of years back, my wife and I ended up starting a company that we called by Dixon. And it's basically all of our work in this space. So around consciousness, spirituality, science. Um, and we have a podcast called Deep Thoughts with the Dixons that we put out a new episode every Tuesday where we get to talk about all these topics that we're really fascinated with. And that's really at a high level kind of the path that I've taken over the last seven to eight years and earlier in my life that has brought me into, from a work and career perspective, the different things that I work on today. Mm. That's very, that's a lot. You have quite a story there. Um, and I, I remember, um, oh, I, I want to talk about, about like the, you know, the crypto and as well as like, you know, the spiritual entrepreneurship. Um, but before I even jump into that, I wanted to say like, you know, just reading your bio on your website, uh, you, you, the very first thing, the very first paragraph was actually all about, at least on the extended bio, um, was, was really all about ancient Egypt and stuff like yeah. that. And I was just wondering like, what, what is your fascination with Egypt and, and you know, that ancient, I guess that, that ancient spirituality or religion and whatnot, just cause I also have, you know, kind of an affinity for ancient Egypt. So I was, I, I wanted to ask you about that too. Sure, absolutely. So very interestingly, ever since I was born, as far as I can remember as a young kid, I have had recurring dreams of ancient Egypt, could never explain it. Like, and when I say ancient Egypt, I mean, like, you know, the times of the pharaohs and uh, when like that, that time period when things were going on, when Egypt was thriving as a civilization. And I would even go to school in like kindergarten and first grade and I would come home from like art class or history class and I would have, I'd draw all these mummies or I'd come home with like an art project where I create a sarcophagus or I would like construct a pyramid and I'd be showing it to my parents and they're like, where are you learning about this? Because you're not reading books on it. You're not watching TV shows on it. And so they were kind of, you know, boggled as well as to how I under, like had all this information, right? And so throughout my whole life, I've had recurring dreams of ancient Egypt, like still to this day, every month or two, I will have an incredibly vivid dream that I am like back in ancient Egypt doing something and like interacting with that civilization. And so I've always had this very like strong attraction to that, that time period, that culture over the years, I've just become infinitely fascinated by it. I've read more books than I could count and watch more documentaries than I could count on the topic. And it's funny, back in 2017, I guess it was, it's always been the number one place that I wanted to go and like visit. And growing up, I never had the opportunity to go there. And then in 2017, I actually surprised my wife and I said, hey, for your birthday, I want to take you to Egypt. And so we actually went to Egypt on a tour and I ended up proposing to her in front of the pyramids and the Sphinx. And so uh, that's kind of a special place in our heart for us. But it, it, it was amazing. When I was there, both of us had this very interesting calmness to how we felt while we were there. Like, we've been here before, can't explain it. But, you know, in a past life, I must have spent some time there, maybe in multiple past lives. I don't know. But I, I strongly believe there's some type of, uh, you know, connection to that place within the world and also that time period within the world and throughout my the entirety of my life I've always just had the strongest attraction there and it's just re reoccurring dreams that happen yeah that's very interesting I, I mean I was going to ask too like you know do you think it's a past life sort of thing it seems sounds like that's pretty much where you've come to as well yeah, I think that's probably the most logical explanation that I can come up with because I definitely believe in that and I think that you know, I, I had somebody actually break down something for me one time that was really fascinating about like past life experiences. And I don't know how many past lives that I've had or that anybody's had because somebody may have had 10 or 50,000, you really don't know. 
But um, an interesting way that I think about past lives, especially when I meet and interact with people, is that there's this cosmic clock and that everybody is on this cosmic clock at a different point in time, right? And so, for example, you may be at 2.30 p.m. on this cosmic clock and you may have had 10,000 lifetimes at that potential uh, time parameter and I may be at 3.30 p.m. or at 1.30 p.m., who knows? And, and that equates to so many timelines and lives that I've had on this cosmic clock. And um, so it's really interesting when I think about it from that perspective that, yeah, I, I definitely believe it's possible that I was there once, twice, maybe even hundreds of times uh, through, through time and space, you know, at a different, a different time period for the reincarnation. Mm. How do you feel about the, uh, there's an idea, um, I don't know if you're familiar with it, about past lives too, that it's kind of like your, um, you almost think about your soul and your past lives kind of like an octopus and you take away the concept of like the linearity because we often think past lives that happened in the past kind of thing, mm -hmm. but rather that like all of these like different lifetimes are kind of happening simultaneously and your soul, you know, being like the body of the octopus is just sort of, ex you know, extending its, you know, its, uh, what do they call the, the, I don't T want to say tentacles. I was denticles. I was like, I was like, they're not tendrils. They're not tendrils. <laughs> yeah. 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 So extending their tentacles out, you know, into like different timelines, but they're all still happening simultaneously. So it's not this linear, you know, kind of thing, but they're all kind of re related and that maybe you're, you know, maybe you're in between Egypt trips, you know, like sort of like you have a, a past life in Egypt and you have a future life also in ancient Egypt, but it's happening like later on your soul's progression. Like, absolutely. What? Yeah. I, I thought about that too. I think that I think time in general is a human construct and is an illusion. And so I think it's very possible that you could be living out multiple different realities in different dimensions at one time um, on different, you know, timelines in a sense that are all happening simultaneously. I, I definitely think that's possible. And I think quantum physics and mechanics is starting to prove that that's very plausible as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. There's um, quantum gravity research is saying that like the particles, the quantum particles can move forwards and backwards in time and imply like reverse causality. So things in the future can be affecting the, you know, things happening in the past and that, mm -hmm. you know, that the linearity is a very 3D experience, but it's not so limited in higher, higher dimensions or realms. Yeah, yeah absolutely. That's Fascinating. So cool. Very. Um, so, okay. So, so let's actually, let's, let's jump back then to this kind of like the subject of spiritual entrepreneurship, because this is really kind of your bread and butter in, in a large way of like what you're doing. And I think that that's very important. Uh, you know, we, we recently also, I don't know if you've seen it. We, we recently put out a, a series called, uh, well, just like a spiritual money or a spirit science money series, uh, mm -hmm. which is really all about this kind of, kind of same subject because, I found for myself that I struggled financially for, for a really long time and I'm still kind of growing through, you know, these changes in, in how I look at money and my relationship with money uh, because the spiritual mindset often is, well, you can't have money if you're spiritual or you can't make money from spiritual offering spiritual value. Right. Mm -hmm. And there's this pervading theme. Right. But at the same time, it seems as though like, you know, if, if there was more things out in the world, you know, like things that have money behind them end up having a lot of like power and authority in the world that if there were more genuine and authentic spiritual offerings uh, that like society could act, may actually like, really evolve consciously in a big way. So, mm -hmm. I mean, what's your, what's your take on, on that, you know, spirituality, money, entrepreneurship, how it all fits together. Like, um, yeah. How do you feel about it? And what do you, sh what do you say to people you know, who are either just coming on that path or maybe struggling with that path and that, you know, that kind of thing. Sure. So I used to think about this a lot in terms of like, if you're, if you're singularly trying to accumulate wealth, is that like a very ego based mindset, right? Like you have this attachment to an accumulation of this financial desire. And on the alternative, like you mentioned, I think it's very common in society for people to think like, if you follow a spiritual path that you have to detach completely from money and you need to focus very intently on just becoming more centered and developing your spiritual abilities and, and your connection to source. And I, I thought about that and balanced that a lot for years and years because I've been so strongly pulled in each direction throughout different times in my life. 
And it's interesting, my wife, I think, actually had a big impact with me on this. So she's from Pennsylvania, but her family is from northern India in a place called Dehradun. And so uh, my whole life, the way that I naturally kind of thought about life and spirituality is exactly how they practice, like a lot of the Eastern practices, is I think is how I incorporate a lot of how I think about things today. And what she told me one time is she said, money is just energy. And if you want it in your life, then you have to begin to vibrate that energy into your life, right? And so she's like, it doesn't have to be independent from a spiritual practice. Um, it's actually very congruent with a spiritual practice because it is literally an energy that you're attracting into your life. And when I really reshaped my perception around that, it helped me integrate better how I thought about it holistically. And so if I if I'm really thinking about it, that if I do good things and I, and I, you know, I feel good about what I'm doing, I'm enjoying what I'm doing. I'm really vibrating that frequency of that love and light in how I'm spending my time each day, that it'll be a, an energetic byproduct of how I'm spending my energy. Right. And that's just a basic law of karma that, you know, what you put out comes back to you. And so if I think that each and every day I'm living my life and trying to get you know, 1% better each and every day with my personal, my professional life, and I'm mixing that spirituality with entrepreneurship, I've seen that begin to enhance and the opportunities and synchronicities that begin to occur over time are remarkable. And, uh, you know, when it first starts happening, you kind of go through that process of, okay, this is kind of strange, you know, what's happening. And then you get to the point where it's like, this is just the way things work, right? This is the, the laws of the universe. And um, when you embrace that, I think that that really helped me better integrate those two together in terms of the spiritual concepts and the entrepreneurial concepts to from a money perspective. Yeah, no, that makes that makes a lot of sense. And I mean, you, you also have a lot of work um, and exploration in like just as you described at the beginning too, like the cryptocurrencies and everything like that. Um, and I, you know, I get a lot of comments even on our, the, the Spirit Science Money series talking about, it's like, you know, maybe the current capitalistic model isn't the greatest and maybe the resource-based economy model also is not going to work, but there's a lot of emphasis from, from at least a certain portion of the audience saying, well, like, you know, the cryptocurrency, the decentralized platforms for for communities and whatnot to to thrive um might be or at least is favorable to again some of the people in the audience and so i mean how would you even describe cryptocurrencies like how do, how do they work uh you know for for people who are as like unfamiliar with them and how they're different sure. from money sure so the way that i understand cryptocurrency and is, is like as a digital asset and it's an opportunity for two parties to exchange almost anything of value in a transparent and trustless manner. So for example, I could send a digital asset from my account to your cryptocurrency account, and I don't need a, a third party intermediary like a bank or a clearinghouse to verify that transaction occurs. I know that it's going to occur because that's how the technology is built. And it's built in an open source forum so that people can actually go in. If you have an understanding of how to read or write code, you can look at it and see how it operates. And when that was invented, kind of the light bulb that went out for me was this is going to create a tremendous amount of transparency around not only the financial system, but all sorts of different systems around the world, like how real estate transactions take place, how personal property transactions take place. Like, um, you know, right now, if you think of like one of the biggest systems in the world that is building out blockchain and cryptocurrency solutions behind the scenes is like Venmo. Venmo is a perfect use case where you can send money from one party to another digitally through your bank account. Um, you know, that's the same concept with a cryptocurrency. And one caveat I'll note is that um, I prefer to use the term digital asset as opposed to cryptocurrency because I think there's so many things that can loop, get looped in. And the connotation of currency, most people think like, I'm going to go to the store and I'm going to buy groceries with it. Um, for, as Bitcoin is an example, which is the most prevalent cryptocurrency, it's not really built for you to go do that. It's not a, it's not a type of uh, digital asset where you would go to the grocery store and you would buy your groceries with it. It's not built that way yet because it can take 10 minutes or longer for a transaction to take place. And you don't want to be at a grocery store standing in line in 10 minutes just for your transaction to clear. 
But there are other types of digital assets where I could be at the grocery store and pay and it would go through instantaneously in a very secure manner. And so um, that's that's why from a cryptocurrency perspective, there's probably two to 3,000 of these different cryptocurrencies that have been developed. Um, but I tend to look at them as more of a digital asset and you're able to just move this asset through the internet from one party to the other, just like I could move information from myself to you via email. Mm, I see. And then you'd have to transfer the cryptocurrency, well, the digital asset, the cryptocurrency from wherever it's stored in the crypto app and sort of transfer it into money into your bank sort of thing? So if you're looking to get it in your native currency, so for example, if I, if I have Bitcoin sitting in an account and I want to transfer that to US dollars, then I would use the platform. A, a very common one is called Coinbase. They're probably the industry leading standard when it comes to a platform where you can have a digital currency wallet and you can store these different cryptocurrencies. Um, within that platform, if you want to convert to US dollar or you're located in another country and you want to convert to that native currency, it's basically just the press of a button and it will do it instantaneously and it will charge a, a small fee for doing so. Yeah, so it's basically like like PayPal, but different. Yeah, in, in a sense, like pay PayPal has a lot of similarities to it. I think PayPal is great because it was a very early version of what the potential for cryptocurrency is going to be in the future. Um, PayPal these days is obviously integrated into almost everything uh, when you're doing online purchases, but we're reaching a point where it'll eventually be Bitcoin or some type of other digital asset that'll overcome that platform. Right, right. And so, okay, so, you know, there's a lot of talk right now about, you know, this big kind of like shift of ages that we're going through, the shift in consciousness, moving from an old paradigm to a new paradigm of, of being. And there's a lot of conspiracies about, you know, like uh, the one world order, new world order, uh, you know, one world government kind of controlling the world and all of this kind of thing. Um, from your perspective, how does, crypt how does crypto and maybe the evolution of cryptocurrencies, like, does it stand to maybe uh, support or to uh, maybe challenge that, you know, shifting model or, or how, how, I mean, how do you see the, the evolution of cryptocurrency playing out in society and like maybe some of the challenges that we're going to face as well, like as we shift and maybe as it relates to some conspiracies or not, you know? So I, this is one of the things I thought was so interesting when I first learned about cryptocurrency and I began to understand it is that I think it does both. I think it helps with the paradigm shift, but it also pushes towards a unified one world government, one world control mechanism. And why it does that is because on the, but let's, let's take the path first with like the one world government scenario. The reason why it's important to have a digital cryptocurrency for that end game is because you can track every single transaction that takes place. You can't do that right now with like a, with just dollars, right? Like I could give you 20 bucks and no one would ever know that that happened. But with cryptocurrency, if I were to send you $20 worth of a cryptocurrency, that transaction is time stamped and you and I both have a unique identifying string of characters that shows that there was a public address, like a digital signature from my account that's sent to your account and you would have a digital signature on your account. So that process, the amount that was sent, the date and time it was sent, and even though it's a string of characters that maybe only you and I know, those are public as well. And so from a, um, a one world government perspective, they can now track every transaction. And that's what they want to happen anyway. Like if, if you want to have ultimate control over people, you want to be able to track and trace the data on everybody, in my opinion. And I think that's um, a big thing that we're seeing right now. And af actually during all the COVID scenario, one, when they were trying to work through some of these stimulus bills, one of the bills that got proposed was a digital dollar, where instead of mailing everybody, you know, twelve or $2,400 checks, like what happened, or doing a direct deposit in their account, they would download an app or set up a web platform that would have a digital cryptocurrency-based dollar that they would just transfer. Now, what I think was actually happening when they were doing that, it was a way to program and condition people for what's to come in the future because it's not that far around the corner before I think we have some type of global one world currency. And so I, I still think that's going to happen. I think that's the direction that we're going. But on the other side, on the path of it can actually help with this paradigm shift of consciousness, 
just because there's a global one world currency doesn't mean there's not going to still be people that are using other types of cryptocurrency as transfers of value that are private and secure that can be transferred off the radar of this one world currency. Like just like today, there's, you know, tons of different types of currencies that are used all around the world. And right now the US dollar is probably like the earmark for how most people value their currencies and they kind of base it off the US dollar. But when the when a one world digital currency happen uh, ends up coming into use and adoptance, we're going to see that happen and it's going to be tracked by the powers that be at all times. And then we're also going to see private types of currencies, I think, that are going to be used as well for people that are trying to avoid being a part of this one world system. Mm. Wow. <laughs> That's crazy. But, but I, mean, I totally agree with you in terms of this. There is, in my opinion, so I've been studying from a conspiracy theory perspective a long, long time on this. And I, um, I think there definitely is an agenda that's being played out as we speak with everything that's happening around the world, especially with this pandemic. And there is unfettered amounts of control that are taking place on people, right? We've got large technology companies that are having mass levels of censorship that only aligns with the official government and certain types of narratives. And it is completely conditioning people to think in a certain way. And when they censor the information through artificial intelligence, they can basically place exactly what they want the audience to see and remove exactly what they don't want them to see. And that's been happening very quickly over the last couple months at a rate that we've never seen before in, in our lives. And I think it's something that's going to continue and it's going to, uh, it's going to advance pretty quickly over the next six to 12 months. Yeah. Well, this is, I mean, that's very frightening to think of. And I mean, you know, there is, I feel like there's a lot of hope in the, you know, the spiritual communities, especially, you know, like we're moving into a new paradigm and uh, an age of light and this and that. But it seems as though on the other side of the equation, it's like, well, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe not so much. It's, there is a lot of control. There's a lot of influence. There's a lot of all this stuff that's happening. I mean, what, what, what do you make of all that? Like, what do you think the end result is going to look like in this whole, this whole game of life we're playing? Sure. So I see a future where there's going to be like segments of people living kind of these uh, almost micro ecosystems of life. And what I mean by that is you're going to have a large mass amount of people that have acquiesced into a state of control that they're okay with, and they will largely be supported by government means, right? There could be a universal basic income because we're seeing jobs right now wiped out on an unprecedented level. So there's a, the middle class right now is just being decimated. There's going to be an ultra elite class and there's going to be a, a, um, a, like a, a low income class that's going to be fed off of the government and off a universal basic income system, potentially. That, that's potentially what I think could happen. Um, and there's going to be this segment of people in this micro ecosystem that'll be okay with that. They're going to be okay with the control. And then I think there's going to be other micro ecosystems where people are going to revolt and stand up and say, we will not acquiesce to this. This is not right. This is not how we're supposed to be living lives as a, as a race. And they will begin to create these new populations of life that happen in very unique ways. And that could be done through a lot of like technology systems that allow you to decentralize the control. And, and you know, cryptocurrency is one example of that. A lot of these new systems that are being developed on top of what's called blockchain technology, which is what cryptocurrency is built on top of. Uh, they create these decentralized technology means where you don't have to have a centralized governing control to have different types of value shared between people in different circumstances. And I see both potentially happening. Um, you know, if, if we wanted to just flat out stop the levels of control that are happening right now, it wouldn't be that difficult because there's a lot more people in the masses that could stand up than there is people at the top that's controlling everybody. But the issue with that that I see is people have become so conditioned to their lifestyles uh, and it's a lifestyle based off of like fear, which is the currency of control. And that type of a lifestyle makes people complacent. And so I think the group of people that, are, that have this more spiritual mindset 
and or have gone through this large paradigm shift of consciousness and an awakening. Um, there's there's a lot of people around the world that this is happening to. I don't know if it's enough people to actually stand up and say we're not taking this that would cause the global shift just yet. I think it could happen in time for sure. But I think that there's so many people that just are are very um, acquiescent to what's going on that I think it's going to be challenging to see, um, you know, like a revolution or a revolt or something like that happen with the current situation. Mm. Well, I, I, you know, I, I really resonate with the, uh, what, what you're saying of like, you know, for the people who are not satisfied with the, uh, the shifting of the paradigm, right. And the, the control that's imposed. I like that idea of like people just, they're like, we'll do it ourselves and they make their own, you know, little microcosm societies and stuff. And that really resonates. So there's probably going to be like, yeah, I mean, but I can see, like that, that's a very clear vision. Like what, what you just described, like honestly, like just props to you for the clarity of what you just described, because I think that that, that feels like, like a logical outcome kind of thing. Um, so I, I wish from my perspective, it was like we had the whole shift, right? And on a global scale, it all went towards the positive direction. And I, you know, that's something that I think about a lot. And I'm like, that would be amazing if that could happen. But I think with just the amount of control that some people are under the grasp of, it's, it, it's difficult for me to envision it that, that would happen globally, in, in a short term at least. Definitely. Well, and, and I mean, here's, okay, so this is a really big question. This came up for me a lot when I was going through my money shifts and my relationship with money and like, you know, doing the episodes as well as the uh, Spiritual Money Mastery Workshop that we created. Uh, like, it's this question of, you know, how much of it, can we, you know, point the finger and say, well, I mean, look at the imposed control versus being like, we have to take full responsibility over our relationship with money. Now, granted, it's like, you know, for the masses, they're not shown this information about consciousness and everything like that. So like we can attribute some of that, you know, like that responsibility of saying like from the powers that be, there's clearly an influence here that's keeping people in the dark. At the same time, you know, for, for what you just described of like people becoming complacent and having this poor relationship with money and surviving off, you know, the government or, or whoever and, and, and not really embodying the fullest essence of themselves. It's like the question of, I mean, is it really right to, to really just be like, oh, it's their fault, the government's fault, they're controlling everybody, da, 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 when we actually have the ability to completely shift our reality if we actually took it into our own hands, like took responsibility for ourselves, our vibration, our relationship with money and our relationship with the world and did something different, you know? And like, I, just as a little example too, like I can say for myself for a long time, I pushed away on that con the conversation of money and, and, and wealth and everything like that. Um, and, you know, try to just disconnect it from my spirituality. But like from just embracing the conversation, embracing the, the the dialogue of how can I change my my resource based vibration into something better. Um, it's it's put me in this position where I'm like, yeah, like I kind of want to. I feel like my part of my path is to actually, you know, keep growing spirit science and keep growing this, you know, everything that I'm doing and get to the point where I, you know, I can one day build like a giant pyramid center. And now, based on or you know, and 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 other really amazing things like maybe like a whole new spirit city of some kind right and like sure. you know it's it's a really exciting vision but at the same time you know I, that would put me very firmly in the camp of the whole like ruling elite because i'd be you know working with the team that would have lots of resources to be able to build all that kind of stuff so um it's you know there's this fine line here this like dichotomy of the world systems yeah. and i i just wanted to ask you like what do you what do you think about that and like where is where is the line of our own personal responsibility in that in the story of uh of, of wealth and conscious evolution and everything like that sure so th this may sound like a slightly egoic based response based on how i'll frame it but it's not meant to be at all and when i think about that concept is i have to have equal resources to do good if i want to compete with people that have equal resources that are doing bad and instilling fear so if I embrace this, like you just mentioned, like if I want to build this spirit science civilization or this new way of thinking or this expanded consciousness practice and in this pyramid center, 
Um, I don't look at from you from that perspective of the same way that I think mo- the connotation of people when they think about like elite technocrats that are basically writing policy for our world that is instilling fear and control on people. I look at that as I'm now taking myself to a resource perspective where I can spread what I know is right, that is coming from my heart, what I, you know, sharing love and light with what I do. And I'm not trying to control other people. I'm trying to create a new way of life for myself. And as a byproduct of that, maybe there's some people along the way that share in that same vision and they can actually change their life for the better as well. And so I look at very much at a perspective of if they have to have that level of resource to do negative things, what I would perceive as negative things in the world, then I can embrace this concept of attracting money through energy throughout my life and accumulate resources that I can do it for positive things. And that's really the perspective that I take on it. Yeah, definitely. I mean, like, <laughs> it's, it, it's, a, it's a kind of a crazy question. I feel like it probably facilitates uh, quite a reaction in people if you bring it up. But like, just even the question of like, well, if you, if you had as much resources as like the guy who made Walmart or, you know, or, or like, or as Jeff, Jeff Bezos or whatever, it's like, what, I mean, what, what could you do with it? Right. And, sure. and there's this, it, you know, you, you, it's very easy to be like, oh, well, you're, you're even thinking such a thing, you know, you must be, you know, this greedy power hungry, da, da, da. but it's like, no, mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know why Jeff Bezos hasn't tried building some, you know, spiritual pyramids and all the things like that. Yeah. Um, it's just like, you know, it's like, it's such it, a, wonderful opportunity to to make some big change but like that's yeah. not their interest so someone with a really you know grounded in truth love and authenticity have to be the ones to like take leaps forward in that direction i think it makes me wonder too sometimes is if when you reach that level if there is a very strong influence that comes in contact with you from groups of people that really do actually run and control our macro economy they come in and say, oh, you've reached this level of influence in the world. You've reached this level of resource. Um, here's how things are going to work now. Like it, it, if there's something like that that occurs, whether it's through like a Bilderberger group or somebody of, along those lines, um, I, I have no idea. But I, I've sometimes wondered that because if you look now at some of the people that are the most, you know, from a business perspective, the most influential and resource driven people that we have, you're thinking of like Jeff Bezos and your Mark Zuckerbergs and the, basically Bill Gates, the, the people that run these massive technology companies. And we've now reached a point where these people are the ones writing policies for things that they have nothing to do with, right? So like as an example, Bill Gates built Microsoft and now through this whole COVID stuff, he is literally determining health policy for our world. Right. And so it's a very interesting disconnect that's happening. Um, And and when you reach that level, it just makes me wonder, like, is there some type of influence from a group of people that does pull a lot of strings behind the scenes that comes in, that comes with you? And it's like, okay, if you want to continue to grow to this level, here's how some things need to work. And it gets very political. Um, I I have no clue, but I, I often think about that from books I've read over the years and things I've learned um, just in my travels around the world as I've seen like, as I've come in contact with very influential business people, the politics that get involved when you reach that level can change people. Fundamentally, they can change people. And so it's like, not only do you have to go hard after, you know, trying to grow something that you align with, but you also have to make sure that once you reach that level, that you stay aligned and you can't get persuaded or acquiesced to an influence of somebody else so that you can make sure you carry out your, your mission. Wow. I mean, I, I'm I'm happy you brought a, brought up the Bill Gates thing, especially too, because like, of course that's a you know the very like a, a hot button for a lot of people, mm-hmm. especially in the conspiracy groups and everything like that. And I I completely sure. see it. And it's like I felt the exact same thing. Like when 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 he was you know at least at least in the last like year or two, as it's at least in my awareness, come more to the surface. Like he's been doing this for a long time with the whole vaccines and talking about an upcoming pandemic and then here we are. Um, But it's like the, it feels to me like looking at his nature and the way that he expresses himself. I feel like he's really genuinely passionate about it. Like it doesn't feel like he sees anything wrong with or manipulative or controlling with, you know, the, the motion that he has. And it made me just feel like, 
there's probably someone or something, you know, some influence behind the scenes that mm-hmm. really pushed him into that path or like, you know, closed them on the idea that it's a good idea to get really deep into vaccines and stuff like this and, and sure. talking about a pandemic because he's just so about it. Um, and I don't know, it's, you know, it, there is a lot of this, like Bill Gates is ruling the world, controlling the world and everything like that. And I'm like, I, I don't actually know about that. I feel like, th- like Bill Gates has a lot of the resources and that someone's maybe pushing his buttons in some way or, I don't, yeah. but I, I mean, I, I, think, I don't really know. I think know, what you know. just said is more likely the scenario. Like, I don't think he, by any means, is is the one, you know, pushing towards a lot of these things. I think there's a hot button, like behind the scenes, that's being pushed, where there's some influence there. Um, I just think that there's that as a human race, you need to question just the logical things that are happening in front of our face to say why is it that out of nowhere, the person that built one of the most successful technology companies in the world is now all of a sudden a point person for dictating global health policy. Very, very different things, right? Um, And, you know, taking the conspiracy uh, conversation out of it, just at its face, that's a very interesting leap that's happened during all this COVID stuff. And from a vaccine perspective, um, because I used to, when I was in the legal space, I used to work on personal injury cases. So people that got injured in car crashes or truck crashes and people that got injured in medical malpractice and things of that nature, A really interesting thing about the vaccine space is that pharmaceutical companies don't have to go to a regular court system if somebody gets hurt with a vaccine. There is a privatized, specialized court system called vaccine courts that any liability that occurs from an injury from a vaccine, the pharmaceutical companies go to this private court where things are heard in front of a private committee with no jury. And then they basically just have to write a check and say, oops, we messed that up. Oops, we killed some people. So it's a very, very crooked system for how that's worked out if somebody actually gets hurt hurt from a vaccine. And that's been happening for a very long time. And so they literally can create these medicines for people and release them into the market and not have to suffer a public consequence if if something goes wrong. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it reminds me of um, there is a, a presentation that was done by Bruce Lipton, you know, biology of belief. Uh, mm-hmm. I've been talking about him so much lately. I, I just like, I'm really, I love, love his work. Um, and, and then I've been reading, like I, I went through the audio book and I've been reading the book, um, but it, there was two different statistics. And I think it was just because of the difference in time. Um, one of the statistics was that the med, like, like, like pharmaceutical medicine was the, the third top, killer basically that caused you know the biggest cause of death in like all of the united states between some period of time and uh and then the other statistic was that it actually had risen to the number one killer uh uh, you know out of out of everything out of like cancer deaths and diabetes deaths and other other death things that cause death like like (laughs) pharmaceutical medicine was the number one thing um and uh and I mean, I, I, I just hear it, you know, everything like that you're describing too, is just people, the, the weird thing is, you know, it's like, there's so much of that complacency where your doctor says, I'm sorry, there's no way that you can survive this and you're going to die, but we can, you know, here's, you know, we can maybe treat the symptoms for, for a while. So here, take like 10 pills a day and all this stuff. And people just go, okay, I guess I'm going to. I'm going to go, you know, like, we, <laughs> like, you know what that's doing to your body long term, right? Like, I think that, like, my, my perspective on this is that I think there's situations where there's like an immediate need for some type of like pharmaceutical intervention, if you have like an outbreak of something, and you've got to control it right away. Um, but Absolutely. It, like, but for a long term to be taking and consuming a pharmaceutical every day on a long term basis makes zero sense to me. And I think the long-term effects of what that does to not only people's bodies, but their psychology of thinking that they need this, right, on a long-term basis, and the habit of taking it, and the addiction that happens with some of these medications, it's crippling to our society. Seriously. Well, I, you know, I'm, I'm working on another workshop right now called spirit medicine walkers, which is all about plant medicine, like ayahuasca healing and stuff like that. Sure. And, uh, and I just finished reading a book called the fellowship of the river. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but it's written yeah. by a, 
a medical doctor who actually helped a shaman to found uh, an ayahuasca healing center down in, I think it was Peru or, or somewhere in Central or South America. Um, what's amazing is that this book is just filled with story after story of like, these people who were told, like, I'm sorry, you have a debilitating disease. You're going to have it for your whole life, and there's no cure for it. So here's this medication. And then that person is like, um, screw that. And they start looking at alternative medicine. And then sometimes as a last, last ditch effort, you know, they go to do the ayahuasca and then just like start healing, you know, the actual root causes of these things and just completely transcending all of their, you know, it's like it's like past traumas and, and abuse and things that they've been through and as as all of this stuff is like purged and healed and everything like that it, it you know it solves that surface level core problem that the doctor told them was incurable sure. and, and that's something I think I mean maybe the, the the big challenge is that that's just not talked about in the mainstream world you know there's far more focus on the on the, the pharmaceutical route, then there is actually like an open sort of acknowledgement that plant medicine is very valuable or that there's other healing methods that you have to treat the, you know, the, the actual, you know, what, what is called the PNEI network or the DMN, you know, these parts of your body, the psychoimmunological, I don't even remember how to say the whole word, but it's basically <laughs> like the, the physical relationship of the emotional body. When you treat sure. that, you can actually facilitate really deep healing. And, you know, this is my big challenge with even with COVID. I was, I was like frustrated at scientists and Neil deGrasse Tyson and people because they, you know, COVID all was exploding. And, and I remember in one particular, I bring up Neil deGrasse Tyson because I watched his podcast. He was talking to some like very prestigious doctor um, and talking about COVID. And they were like, well, like how can, you know, Neil asked the doctor, he's like, well, how can, you know, people like, uh, prevent the, the, you know, the, the whole thing. And in the entire conversation, all they really said was wash your hands and stay away from each other. And, and there was no conversation about like, what about actually like strengthening your immune system, you know, yeah, or like anything ridiculous. like that, not even on the conversation radar. And it was yeah. so, it was just frustrating to me to see that. Why don't you go stand out in the sunlight where it could just kill the virus for a while, right? Like boost your immunity. Like, it, 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 I agree with you 100%. It makes zero sense. There's, there's not a logical person that can look and say, let's go put a, let's stay away from people. Let's put masks on 24 seven where we're breathing in our own carbon monoxide that is incredibly damaging to our respiratory system. Then when we start coughing, we're going to send them to the hospital. We're going to call it COVID-19 because we get a $39,000 bump in our financial contribution from the government for labeling it that way. Like, it, it makes zero sense to me. And I agree with your point on, the plant medicine stuff, I strongly believe that there's probably a plant that exists somewhere in the world that can heal any type of illness that could ever happen, right? Like, I just think that there's that type of connection within nature that there is, has to be something that exists. And most of these things are known that you can take plant medicine of different types, herbs, minerals, roots, uh, other types of plant medicine, and it can cure different illnesses. But the biggest issue with that in our current society is that there is no profit in curing something. You right. have to keep people just sick enough that they keep coming back to buy another pill, right? And that's, that's really unfortunate, but that's kind of how it works. I mean, that's, that's the hard truth of it. Mm -hmm. um, you're going to laugh. I, okay, let me just check and see if I actually have this picture. If not, I'll just, um, just so I can read it out. But otherwise, sure. I'll just describe it. There was a, a post that I saw. I think this is it. No, that's not it. Um, I think it was on Reddit. Yeah, no, I'm not really seeing it. So maybe I didn't take a screenshot. Um, okay, so it, it was a post that I saw. It was like a, actually like a news thing or um, someone, actually maybe Collective Evolution posted it, I, I think. But either way, it was, it was basically this like news clipping that said that um, Bill Gates and like these, you know, high level, you know, you know WHO or whatever people were like having like a, a private, seminar study thing, um, uh, think tank thing, to try and figure out how best to convince uh, the, the, the American public that taking a vaccine was a good thing. And it was just like, because so many people were like, you know, very opposed to the idea of mass vaccinations, that they're like trying to come up, how, how do we convince people to do this? Sure. And just seeing that like really just made me laugh because, it, you know, it's going to probably take some, and well, 
it's kind of unfortunate to say because they probably will come up with some crazy marketing scheme to oh, yeah. to, to, to facilitate it. But it, it will need <laughs> to be like this big marketing push to to get people to start you know vaccinating in mass, and that's it, it'll be crazy. scary if they start to say you can't travel unless you show us your vaccination certificate, right? Like that'll be very freaky if that ends up happening, but it's not unreasonable to think that could occur. There's something like that right now. Um, I, you know, even regarding like, I, I was just talking with uh, someone from Rhythmia and obviously Rhythmia is closed right now because of the, because of COVID and whatnot. But, um, but that like the Costa Rican government uh, is open for travel, but you have to have a, a, a negative COVID test within 48 hours of your trip. And then even like, you know, I, I know for Canada, the moment that you get back, you have to self quarantine for 14 days afterwards. So that's going to be a lot of people are going to be like, Oh, geez, like, I don't want to travel anywhere because I'm going to have to stay home alone for 14 days afterwards. But even then, like to go anywhere, or at least to go to Costa Rica, and probably a lot of other countries. Sure. Um, you know, for those who have implemented this rule, it's like you got you have to have a COVID test. And that I think the thing that people are really scared of is that, yeah, it's like what you said, like having a vaccination or having like a proof of vaccination, like chip, like put in your arm or something like that, you know, yeah. so that you can prove that you've been vaccinated. Um, that really, that's that bridge to that, like mass monitoring, you know, like microchipping people and everything like that. It's kind of a, I mean, that's something that a lot of people are talking about is coming. And uh, mm -hmm. I think what we, what we sometimes miss, you know, don't realize is that we, we don't really need to be chipped. We're all carrying cell phones. Like we're already kind of chipped. In a yeah, we legitimately are already like a, a bionic organism because this is on our hip or our hand or, you know, if you're in your purse or whoever you keep it, it's with us 24 seven. Right. So yeah. like the, the leap from the device to the, like the human integration, it's funny. I actually, I just recorded a podcast that released today with my wife yesterday. And we talked about this, of this topic of um, the, transhumanism basically right like we are making these leaps where we are people are becoming more and more comfortable with the integration from technology leaping off of a device to being integrated with your body and it's happened very slowly over time but it's starting to happen a lot faster and what i was talking about was that when you're walking around now and everybody's wearing masks when they're in public and you see them and you only see each other's eyes right it creates a very robotic psychological response because there's no facial expression. So this continues to happen. People begin to get conditioned to not have emotion. Well, what doesn't have emotion? Robots. So when we take this leap, it, it may seem like this dystopian scientific or science fiction future, it's, it's not that far off to the point where we have technology where robots are much more integrated with our society in a way that they're not right now, like actually robots in your homes or things like that. Like being in this space, I really see how fast technology moves. And this is already being done in some countries, right? Like there's, there's robots that look like humans. But I think what, if you look at this conspiracy theory agenda, what could potentially be happening is they're slowly conditioning people to remove the component of emotion so that it seems more robotic because eventually when this transhumanism stuff happens and there's a, a much more prevalent amount of, of robots, they're not going to be, you know, they, they may do it from a, a human perspective because we feel more comfortable interacting with a human than we would like a metal robot. But um, I think that there's, there's some conditioning that's happening that people aren't thinking about from a psychological perspective that is actually creating the segue to what we're going to see with the technology integration coming forward. Yeah, I'm, I'm really happy you brought that up because um, I had on my list of wanting to talk to you about like tech and consciousness and tech, tech and, and the bio, you know, that merging together because obviously it's starting with the cell phones, but there's, I mean, there's so many more levels that we can go to. And I remember, um, I think it was the Elon Musk podcast with Joe Rogan. I think the first one that they did where Joe had this great question about that. You know, it's like kind of the inevitability of like what happens when, even if it starts as something really simple, like, uh, you know, like, 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 you know, they, they develop a new robotic eyeball for people who are blind and then they, you know, they, they do like an eye transplant surgery and they give a blind person this robotic eyeball and then suddenly the blind person can see. And then 
technology gets better and now they can see better than people can and now they can pick up mm -hmm. wavelengths that are outside of the range of the human eye and now you have robotic eyes that have x-ray vision and people with normal eyesight who can see fine are like oh, i want that you know like let me <laughs> scoop out my eyeballs and give me give me some robot ones right or at least one you know like having like a cyborg eye or whatever and sure. um and i mean like that the the, the even the, the progression of how that starts seems very uh, what's the word innocuous uh, of like, mm -hmm. it's very, it's very, it seems very genuine. It's like, I, I'm a scientist. I want to help blind people see we have all this cool technology. I want to build a cool eye. And it becomes this like bionic human movement that happens. And, yeah. you know, even Elon Musk, he described, you know, with neuro, with Neuralink that he's making, um, he's like, what happens when, you know, yeah, you okay, maybe you have a chip in your brain or whatever, but then like you can download the internet and interface with the internet directly from your mind. And I had to stop actually, because up until that point, I had been very, you know, just like pfft, chips, brain, you know, all these kind of things. This is ridiculous. I would never do anything like that. And mm -hmm. then all of a sudden I was like, wait a second. I could like download encyclopedias and libraries of books into my brain, like the matrix. Like I could literally just lie down and be like, like I know everything there is to know about ancient Egyptian mythology within an hour or something right like like uh -huh. i could you know and i was just thinking about the the practical value of that of like the amount of time it takes me to read books versus the amount of time it would take to just download it into my brain i'm like oh crap yeah. like that's actually kind of awesome but then you know obviously it also comes with that like you know you're chipped you're gridded maybe maybe the you know the controlling people who made the chips or the whatever they could like use it to like mind control and all of these things so there's this really dangerous line here but at the same time like it seems like this sort of inevitability that we're moving towards regardless and it has the potential to create either superhumans or you know mass robots you know like like people who are just like glue you know just just stuck in this sort of weird mental internet hive mind thing but they, they lose their sense of individuality and yeah. so i think there's a big concern there but i mean that's a big data dump like what do you think about all of that so i have a fundamental concern with the connectivity i i think it's going to happen regardless i don't think anybody's going to stop it the biggest concern that i have about it is that if we just use what's happening right now as a case study on this. So you go on YouTube as an example, right? And you try to search for anything that doesn't align with the official narrative of the CDC and the World Health Organization about COVID-19, it's been deleted. It's, these people have been deplatformed. People that have had, I mean, there's a guy that I've listened to for years on a podcast called London Real. His name's Brian Rose. Yeah, yeah, He yeah. had millions of followers. And then he interviewed a couple people on his podcast that had some conflicting concepts about what the mainstream media was discussing with COVID. They just deleted him. They just deplatformed him and removed all his episodes. And he'd been on there for 10 years, built like several million followers, right? Um, so right now we're seeing this censorship happen. And what happens with censorship is you, when you can control the information, you can bend it any way you choose. And that's what we're seeing right now. So my fundamental concern is that when we reach a point where people are integrated with this technology and you can download information from the internet, you're only going to be able to download what you have access to. And so you could basically be changing your perception of reality and of our world because the information that you're downloading is false or is intentionally not true, right? Um, and that's a scary concept, right? Like if you, it, like it, it will, like you mentioned, it will deprogram individuality and it will delete like people's ability to have their own intuitive and inspired thought. And I think that's one of the biggest things that is an interesting conversation is that the more you advance with technology, the, the lower your intuition can become because you're so reliant on extreme amounts of data points to make decisions for you and extreme amounts of information. But you don't always know if that information is actually accurate from what you're getting. Like if I go on Google and I search for something 
I may read several different articles and see what sticks out in their common themes because these days you don't know what's real and what isn't, right? There's so much fake news. There's so much information. There's so much news that's intentionally manipulated to get people to think a certain way. And so although I do think that this is happening and I don't think it's going to stop at the rate at which technology is accelerating, that's a concept that I think is going to have to have some, um, some really thorough ethical discussions around it. And I wouldn't be surprised if when we reach that point that information, you know, people are trying to seek information from non-traditional means so that they can try to verify its authenticity. Wow. Wow. Because it, so, you could you could literally fundamentally change your entire perspective on reality if you're constantly connected to the internet and you're getting funneled information and it's very narrow, right? Like that could very, that would happen to any that would happen to any of us. So. I mean, I think that and I think that, that happens is or is already happening regardless with social media and like 100%. I mean, the amount of time that people just spend just go on Facebook and you just scrolling and scrolling and 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 sometimes at least in my experience it's like not even really reading everything just yeah. sort of seeing like what is who is saying what i don't care i don't care yeah. i don't care. you know <laughs> our attention span our attention spans going like this right it's just right. getting smaller and smaller the average attention span because of these social media flicks these days is like two to three seconds for people I know that's it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a huge <laughs> problem especially for i mean I, yeah it's it's crazy like wow, uh, something, something really has to change. Um, but, and, and maybe it's the introduction of a, like a, a new or better technology, or maybe it's the literally the exact opposite of people getting so fed up that they just like, screw it. I'm going to go live in nature and read a book. You know? Yeah. <laughs> and I, I think our human, I think our, so here's how I interpret consciousness. Cause I think it plays into this conversation. So I think we are so much more advanced than any device that we can yeah. use. But Definitely. we've just forgot how to unlock it, right? Like it, it's been suppressed over time. We haven't been taught the right way. And there's a lot of things that you can do in, in lifestyle and spiritual practices that you can do to try to expand this intelligence and expand, expand this consciousness. But it's not taught in schools, right? We're, we're programmed from a very young age to go through a certain process, to come into the working world, to accumulate debt, to like, like there's a long process of what society has built into this system and what i consider the truly valuable and important things that make us unique as a species we're not taught that ever in school so you have to go seek that and learn that truth on your own if you really want to and um you know hopefully there will, there will be this paradigm shift when that happens but i truly think that our consciousness like i think human beings are when you say like a human is conscious i think that it's a really interesting conversation because i think consciousness just exists and we are receivers of it, almost like we're wearing this headset in a sense that's tapping into this universal source that exists. And I've had some really remarkable experiences that have happened to me throughout the years where I have actually seen through what I will call our holographic reality, because that's how I perceive it. Um, through deep, deep meditations, I mean, I've had some experiences where I've actually like seen through what, what, what I can literally, the best way that I can literally describe it would be like um, a, a beautiful energy architecture, you know, whether it's machine, I'm not sure exactly what it is, but just this beautiful energy architecture of colors that I could never describe. And then projecting off of that is the reality, right? It's like, it's the, the, the home, the couch, the TV, the computer monitor, and there's a guy that I've started listening to recently, and his name's escaping me right now, but he's been interviewed um, in several podcasts, and he's a scientist and um, quantum physicist and things that basically has discovered that this is likely what our reality is, that, we, that there is this holographic projection that is coming off of some very advanced um, source or whatever you want to call it, but that what we see on a daily basis is basically a perception of this holographic projection that exists. And although we can touch it and it feels real, in reality, it's not. It's just this like consciousness headset that we're wearing in the, and we're decoding information in a human experience. Um, but th throughout my life, as I've had like several of the times where this has happened to me and I've, I've had this really interesting thing where like I've seen the, I've actually seen the holographic projection jumping off of this energy architecture. I, I've spoken depth about this with your colleague, Ben, who connected us. And um, 
it like the first time it happened to me after a very deep meditation, I was sitting on the couch and it happened to my wife and me at the same time. And we had just done a super long meditation and we could see through each other. Like we could literally see through each other. And it was almost like consciousness connected at the same time and like gave us this window where we got to peek in to see behind the scenes of the illusion of our reality. And it happened. And I was like, it took me like seven days to process it. I was like, like I barely said a word for a week. And it was so mind blowing because throughout my life, I've known that there is so much more than what we can see through our eyes and, and our level of perception. But for the first time, I actually like perceived it and experienced it. And even though it was for a glimpse, like a, like a short period of time, it was like such a monumentally impactful experience that it took me a couple of days to like process it and be like, wow. So everything that we see around us is just, you know, in a sense, it's, it's kind of an illusion from what actually exists behind the scenes. Um, and so I really think that like the, from a conscious perspective that we're here and we're just receiving this information. And it actually exists far beyond us. And that's why I think there's so many interesting things that can happen. Like you can have people that can, you can be thinking about somebody and they text you right then. You know, you can be like, I've had the weirdest things happen that just prove this theory over and over again. Like one time I was in Hong Kong on a business trip and we were, my, my partner that I was there with, we were trying to get in touch with somebody who had a meeting set up for us the next day. And Hong Kong has like 8.5 million people in it. And it's very highly concentrated, in a small area. And can't get a hold of them. Um, we're calling them. We're texting them. And then um, we're like, you know what? Hold this meet us at the meeting in the morning. Let's go grab some dinner. So we're walking down the street. Somebody backs up out of a 7-Eleven type convenience store, not paying attention with like a soda and a bag of chips in their hand into us and like knocks me off the sidewalk and turn around and it's the person we were trying to get in touch with. Like just, just things like that that are just so remarkable. It's like everything is connected and it just makes perfect sense. <laughs> <laughs> man i love everything you just said and it just aligns so well with like experiences that i've had that just mirror that same thing and uh and i want to bring it full circle here this is really going to be perfect and then maybe we'll, we'll we'll start to wrap this thing up but uh yeah. bringing it full circle isn't it amazing that when you go back you know thousands of years and you look at like what the ancient egyptians believed or what was written about in like even ancient greek culture and stuff like that but really especially like the 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 hermetica and you know the the writings of thoth and the you know like the Kabbalion, which is of course much more recent but still like a hermetic principles and everything it really describes everything that the quantum physics physicists and everybody is like starting to validate like right now it's like oh, yeah. you go back i was just transcribing this earlier today actually for another workshop i'm doing but the you know like the seven principles uh from the Kabbalion, based on the hermetic principles and teachings are like that everything exists within the mind of God, that we are, mm -hmm. that it, like the reality is this illusionary, this transcendent illusionary field, uh, this matrix, you know, but that the, the higher reality is invisible. And this is like a Kabbalistic thing too, spanning back, you know, uh, several thousand years to that, that basically says, it's a, it, the Kabbalists describe it as the language of roots and branches. They say that reality is like a tree that forms under the surface, like the seed starts from growing underground where you can't see it. And mm -hmm. then from that, that underground source, right, then you have the tree that grows up and rises up and then you have that which is visible. But everything that is visible is actually emerging from that which is invisible, that which is hidden or underneath the surface. And then if we want to become masters of our reality, masters of time and space and masters of, you know, just like, like understanding what this whole reality and creation and everything is, that we have to go within ourselves and see and perceive the hid, that which is hidden within us and shine light on it to reveal it and then and then we begin to like you know heal our karma resolve our our traumas and step into higher and higher ways of being sure i agree with that 100 percent. yeah isn't that so cool though like that i mean especially just it. the whole egypt thing you know they they knew it <laughs> they knew it they, and i think they knew it long before then and i think that it's been i sometimes wonder has it been lost or has it been purposefully suppressed by by groups of people um, and it's been purposely suppressed potentially as a control, like a long term control mechanism. But I truly think, I mean, history, if you know, it always repeats itself. And I feel like we're reaching a point where, you know, there's the way that things have evolved, there could be some breaking points at some point, maybe in our lifetime, you never know. But um, 
I, I truly think that things repeat themselves. And I think that that knowledge has been captured, understood, studied, and leveraged in societies in ancient times over and over and over again. And I don't think it's been lost and suppressed once. I think it's probably happened repeated times throughout history. And um, it's, it's so fascinating because you're right. Like when you go back and you really look, like when I was there and I was looking at all these statues and I'm walking through like um, these different temples they have and just the way that they created these pictorial diagrams and stuff. It's like, they got it. They get, they understood it and they were, and they were using it. And today we don't know anything about it or, or maybe there are people, but it's been hidden, but um, yeah, it's, it's so fascinating. It's really cool. Yeah. That's so wild. So um, man, Brian, this has been like just a, an amazing conversation. Like we've covered so much ground and I, I want to ask you just like in the spirit of, you know, kind of bringing everything to, you know, wrapping everything up and bringing things to a close. Like, what would you say, you know, for anybody listening here, like, how, like what would you say is the biggest takeaway from like all of this and what, like, what can people do to maybe be on the more harmonious side of the shifts that are taking place? Sure. So I think one of the most important things that people can do, and this is something I try to practice strongly every single day, is if you can get yourself to a point where you relieve the ego and the judgment from anything else that's happening in the world, and you only focus on yourself, and that sounds very selfish, right? But I don't mean it in a selfish way at all. I mean, you have to truly understand how to have total emotional control over yourself and, and, and take all the background noise out of the equation. And if you can work on yourself every single day for that, in time, you will literally transform yourself as a person. And when you relieve the need to try to control other people or try to control circumstance, and you just focus intuitively on what you want and have total undeniable faith that it will happen, but don't put a timeline on it either. And you just work on better in yourself. It's like, kind of like what you said, like if you can find the light within yourself and you really work on yourself, it, it creates this healing and light effect. I, I work on that every single day. And I think that's, it's been the most monumentally impactful thing that I've been able to accomplish. And I'm still working on getting 1% better, 1% better each day. And I think if people can focus on that, they will recognize that things that don't align with them anymore will fall away, right? Things that do will begin to happen. It's just like a, it, from a very basic energy perspective, like when you start changing your energy, p the energy that's not aligned will go away. Energy that is will attract itself to you, right? And I think that that's like such an important thing that people should be thinking about on a daily basis because if you can just relieve the need to control people and circumstance and other types of things in your life and only focus on controlling yourself, um, for the positive and for the bettering of yourself. It, it, like if one person does it, there's going to be some of their friends that are going to see and be like, what, what's happening there, right? Like, what, did that, what is that person doing different? And they'll start to observe and pay attention. And then they may take some of those habits as well. And then their friend may, and then their spouse may, and then their mom may. You know, I think it creates this really fascinating ripple effect when you just relieve the need for, for the control, right? When you say, I'm here, I'm having a human experience, um, as a, a great quote I heard yesterday is that human beings, like we get so intertangled in like male, female, sexual orientation, race, like all these things that are coming up in society right now. And the quote I heard that was so awesome is that you are literally everything that has always been, everything that is, and everything that will be as consciousness. And you are having a very, very brief experience right now as the human that you are. And it doesn't end there. And so if you can think about that in that way that you are everything that's always been, everything that is, and everything that will ever be, then I think that uh, it's a great mindset to have every day. You know, it really helps put things in perspective. Makes you a lot more even keel and, and, and at peace with yourself and loving to other people and compassionate. Mm. I think that was beautifully said. And that's an excellent point to bring this thing to a close. So uh, for Brian, so if um, for anybody who's just listening and they want to like check in with you and um, you know, check out your website and, and tune into everything that you're do working on, or maybe even get your help, you know, doing an entrepreneurial startup of some kind. Uh, how sure. can someone find you? Absolutely. So feel free to reach out through the website. The website is bydixon.com and that's B-Y-D-I-X-O-N.com. 
Um, also from a social perspective on every social platform, my handle is Brian Dixon 6 B-R-I-A-N-D-I-X-O-N-06. Please connect with me on there, drop me a message or a note. And um, those are probably the two best ways to get in contact with me. And I'm you know, happy to help anybody if anything that I've said resonates or you want to talk about it further or you're working on a company or I, we do a lot with uh, coaching people around the world as well that are just looking to better integrate the personal and professional aspects of their life and, and better balance, you know, awakenings and spirituality and things like that within their business. Cause it's a, it's a challenging thing for people. So um, we work with a lot of clients around the world in that space as well. In addition to everything I do with the startups and the entrepreneurial stuff. And awesome. uh, one other thing I'll note that people can access through the site is during COVID we, my wife and I said, you know, let's, let's figure out a way that we can really do something positive with all this stuff going on. And so we wanted to take like 17 years worth of our learnings with everything that we've talked about in the space, everything from like health and nutrition and things of that nature, uh, meditation and different types of pranayama breathing protocols that have really helped us personally. And we created a course around it. And so there's a video course that people can access as well. If you're interested in that, reach out to me and I can send you the link or you can access it through the site as well. But um, it's, it's super, super helpful. There's a lot of guides that come along with it that can help people you know, stay healthy during this time, keep the right mindset, keep making sure you're, you're staying physically and mentally fit while everyone's stuck inside their homes right now. Wow. That's really special. Yeah. And we'll make sure to put links down in the comment, author comments below as well. So that anybody listening can just, uh, at least, uh, you know, as far as YouTube goes, um, you know, can check it out there. Sure. So that with that, great. Brian, thank you so much. This has been great. And all right. Well, thanks for having me. I'm grateful to be here. Appreciate it. Yeah, definitely. And that's a wrap everyone. All right. <laughs>